Good morning, Christina. Oh, good morning. I guess it's not morning for you, is it? Not quite? Well, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. It's late morning. Yeah. I, so uh, I haven't had my coffee yet, so a little <laughs> behind. <laughs> I've had two already, so oh. I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah, so there's going to be a Starbucks run in my near future. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so continuing our conversation from last week, um, uh, shifting over to you and what you do. And for people that are watching that aren't familiar with you, you're Christina Bruce and you are a body acceptance coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Why don't, right off the top, why don't you um, share your website? Uh, for us so that when we're talking about what you do and some of your resources, people know immediately where they can go look for that. Yeah, sure. It's christinabruce.com. So Christina with a K. Okay, beautiful. Um, the thing I kind of, you know, wanted to mention to you off the top that really resonated when I took a look at your site, um, you have something about, I'm totally paraphrasing, but something about how you help women work through the fear of letting go of fighting their body and that really resonated with me in this you know because right now I've put on a little bit of stress weight and I'm really feel I really feel it health wise as well like I feel my mobility is a little bit less I get a little bit winded more easily so when I you know read about the fear of letting go I was like yeah I'm not ready to let go of like like, I don't hate my body, but there's this, like, I want to keep really focusing on it and working with it. And yeah. So can you talk a little bit on what that means and what you see in your clients around sort of that letting go issue? Yeah. Yeah. So it already, like you kind of described a little bit of what will start what might start to happen for people if they if they have this idea of letting go and meaning like they're letting go of kind of being in control of their body size of being on top of things right like making sure like they're eating healthy and they're working out there's a regiment to it or there's there's a there's a control element right and what happens is is especially growing up in this culture we are um, taught and conditioned that there is a right way to eat, that there's a wrong way to eat. And, and that, um, you got to learn that <laughs> in a way like there's, you know, I mean, there's whole courses you can take on the right way to eat. There's all of these diets. Um, there's, you know, exercise programs. Like we're kind of taught that it's something we're either doing or we're not doing, and we want to be doing it. And if we don't, we're going to be not doing it. So, yeah we live in this world sort of where we think that there, like there's an, there's an on or an off you're on the bandwagon or you're off the bandwagon. There's not really this like middle ground, which would be like, what if I just didn't have to be on the bandwagon? Does that immediately mean I'd have to go off the bandwagon or could there be some kind of middle path? But what happens is, is because most of us have just been conditioned into following diets and because we grow up in a culture that teaches us that fat is bad. And so I tend to focus a lot with women on weight. That is, that is really like my main focus. Now, <clears throat> issues with your body can go beyond just weight, but let's be real. Like what's the one thing that most people are focused on? It's their weight <laughs> like that, when it comes to bodies, um, particularly women. So since we are so conditioned to believe that fat is bad, um, we're going to be fearful of it. And we've often like grown up, probably had negative experiences where people have made comments to us about gaining weight, or you just kind of pick it up listening to comments from your family, like commenting on other people's bodies, like even on TV, like you'll learn quickly that to gain weight is a bad thing. You just don't want to do it. Um, and a lot of people will go to extremes or engage in things that actually really aren't healthy for them, so long as it leads to weight loss. So I'm, I'm kind of going broad here and a little bit on a tangent, but bear with me. Um, that's the foundation, right? That's the baseline. So if that's what we're working off of, um, and we feel like 
well, if I just kind of live my life and I'm not on top of it, I'm going to gain weight and that's bad. So we follow these diets, right? So we're, we're constantly like, I'm either on it or I'm off it. And so what ends up happening though, is because we end up being so focused on following these diets, watching our weight, like maybe you're not following a specific diet, but maybe you're just quote unquote, watching your weight. either way, like there's some sense of control or there's some sense of being on it. And that takes a lot of effort. It takes willpower. Um, it also takes a lot of denying yourself. Like you're constantly having to say no, it saps you of your energy and eventually you're just going to either be depleted from doing it, or there's also going to be this kind of rebellious part of you. That's like, screw this. Like I want what I want. And like, I'm going for it. So you end up swinging kind of all the way over to the other side and you go on, like you end up, you know, you're like, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to do whatever. It's a cheat day or it's the weekend and you just binge or, or you just stop everything you're doing. And it can and eat a whole feel... cheese, cheese, cheese stuff pizza yourself. I don't exactly. know. Exactly. Like whatever it might be, you know, for me, it was like a whole container of peanut butter, chocolate, Hagen dazs Like that was my go-to. So you just, you go off the wall and then, and then you don't feel great doing that. You know, like you feel kind of gross. You were maybe also exercising. Now you're not exercising as much. So you're feeling more lethargic and you're like, and then fear kicks in. Like you might start gaining weight and you're like, holy crap, like this is what happens. See, this is what happens when I'm not watching it. So I'm starting Monday, I'm back on it. Right. And so it ends up like you end up living in this swinging cycle. So you have the experience of when I let go, things go bad. Like I end up swinging all the way to the other side and I don't feel good. I gain weight. I can't trust myself. So I have to, I have to go back. Right. So when that is your experience of letting go, who's, <laughs> Who's going to do that? (laughs) You know, like, I don't, I don't want to do that. No way. So there's a huge fear there. So what I, but, but, okay. So, so what ends up happening is that if that is, if that is what you believe. So if you believe fat is bad, I can't gain weight because of all of the reasons that I've learned, like people are going to judge me. I'm going to be unhealthy. My life's going to be miserable. I'll never find a partner, like, et cetera, et cetera it's going to seem like you got to keep your body small at all costs where I kind of come in with people. And this is based on also my own journey with this too, because I was trying to keep my body thin for so long because I, I never had a thin body. Like I was always just like average sized, but I felt like, well, if I'm thin, like I hear how the women in my family were always dieting they were always praising, um, people who were thin, they were always making comments of how gorgeous someone who was thin. So I thought, well, that's obviously a really good thing. And I want their admiration. Like I want my family to think well of me. So I want to be thin. And so I spent a lot of years restricting my food, exercising, honestly, on the outside, everybody would have thought I was healthy. Mm. And I was like, I was, I was miserable. Like it got to a point. I mean, I didn't know I was miserable until the end of when I just realized I couldn't do it anymore. Like I couldn't be living my life where I was, and actually I didn't really know this until my, well, my now husband, but boyfriend at the time moved in with me. And I realized like, oh, it was either exercise or, or watch TV with him. It was, um, he couldn't make dinner because I couldn't control all the ingredients he was putting in. Like, was he measuring the right amount of dressing for me? Like, like I, I was getting to see, because when I lived on my own, I could control it all. But all of a sudden when I was with somebody, um, I couldn't. And it was like, I could see how it was literally cutting into my relationship with him. And I was so, um, I didn't know, like I was so emotionally unstable because I was so hungry all the time Mm. and I was stressed all the time because every time I would get on the scale, 
it would dictate my mood for that day. So it was affecting him. Like he was like, I didn't know who was going to come out of the bathroom in the morning, like depending on what happened. Right. It got that bad that I was like, I can't, I, I just can't do it anymore. And yet I was still terrified of gaining weight because I didn't want to lose everything that I had gained from being then, yeah. which was like when I was younger and I was dating, I wanted all of the hot guys to like me. Like who doesn't, right? In a way. And when I lost weight, all the hot guys started liking me. Like it was so significant, right? Like I was like, like guys who wouldn't give me the time of day all of a sudden would. And I'm like, oh, and like guys would even like, like there was a guy in my friend group. He would say to me, he said to me, he's like, yeah, we talk about how hot you are now like only because I lost weight. So it was so like, it was so heartbreaking to me to get to this point where I was like, what do I choose now? Do yeah. I choose to live in a place where I'm constantly stressed? I'm hungry all the time. I'm there's no freedom. I am not free. I'm completely locked in. Like I use the analogy that it felt like I was holding a beach ball underwater all the time. Like at any second, if as soon as I made the slightest move, it would pop up. That would be my weight, right? Like as soon as I stopped putting the control on, my weight would pop up. So what mattered to me now? And it was just like my soul was calling to me saying like, this just can't be, this can't be, how, this can't be life. Yeah. This can't be how you live. And there's got to be a way that I can feel good in myself without needing the validation of other people, because that's what I was really seeking, right? Like my validation and sense of worth was coming from other people's approval. If they thought I was beautiful, then I thought I was okay. But I never, even so I never really felt okay because I could lose it in a second, right? So it started this journey for me of letting go. And what that looked like was scary. Because what I didn't know, and this took a lot of time me after like doing a lot of learning and understanding of, of, of weight science and the psychology around food and uh, the impacts of dieting and all of this kind of stuff. I went on this long journey, educational journey that I had to go through this period of what I call like backlash eating, or I use it, I use it as the example of like, if you can imagine that you're pulling a rubber band back, the further you pull it back and you let it go, the farther it's going to fly. Right. So when I had been restricting, I had pulled it back so far. Well, in order to let go now, that rubber band had to fly in order for all of the energy of that to dissipate. So that meant for me, like I, I literally had said, I am going cold Turkey. I'm throwing out my scale even though I previously tried to throw it out two more times, like, and just panicked and rebought another one because my friend at one point was like, why don't you just not weigh yourself? And I'm like, uh, okay. And then I tried it for a week and I was like, nope, <laughs> I was like, no way. Like, but I finally threw it out and I'm like, whatever happens, I'm, I'm going to go through this. And so I went through a period of eating it, like I think I ate ice cream every day maybe multiple times a day for a month and I rapidly gained weight like I did there was just no holding back because my body was not happy at the size that it was it just didn't want to be that small it didn't it wasn't designed to be that way so the weight the weight really crept up and everything was emotional the whole process was emotional, right? It was all, and it was, and it was based on all of these fears and thoughts that were coming up of what, like, I didn't feel safe. Like I didn't feel secure in myself because, well, firstly, I was getting all my validation and worth from everybody else. And now I was like purposely going ahead and saying, I'm going to lose that. I'm letting it go. And, and I saw it, it happened. I used to, I, I was, I used to work in a job where I was in meetings and events. So I would run these events and I would see people like I would travel across Canada and do these events. You know, I hadn't seen people in a year or two years and I would be there and routinely they would see me and be like, oh my God, how are you? You look gorgeous. Like you look so good, right? Like they would always comment on how good I looked. That stopped. Like people stopped saying anything to me. And in fact, I had several people 
like pat my belly and ask me if I was pregnant. <laughs> oh no. Right? Because I mean, t- to their fair point, they'd only known me really thin. And all of a sudden now I would gained weight and I had a little belly. So they were just like, she must be pregnant. <laughs> you know, they knew I had a partner. Like they just, that's what they thought. But of course, like we're so conditioned to believe that that's a bad thing to say because we think, oh, well, what you're really saying is you're fat. And, and that means, what does that mean? You're not good enough. You're ugly. Like all of these beliefs that we have around that. So I started to, because I was on this journey, I, one of the things that I started to do was I remember saying to them, no, I I'm not pregnant. I just gained weight. And I wouldn't be ashamed about it. And I, and I, it was kind of in a way it became fun for me because they would end up having this really embarrassing reaction to it. And I was just kind of like, I mean, I can't say that there wasn't a part of me that felt like a, a trigger of, oh, like that hurts because they don't, you know, like I must not be as good. But anyways, because I was on this journey, I, <laughs> I would have some fun with it. Um, but it was a lot, right? So I had to start to really uncover, I had to go through this physical period of eating and realizing that it did end up ending, right? So, okay, bear with me. I know I've just been talking, so I'm just going to talk. Oh, no, this is your whole thing. You don't even need to ask me a question. I'll just go. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, so the part of the letting go, so there's, so it's like multi-layered, right? It's the one where we think all we're ever going to do is eat ice cream all day, eat cookies all day, sit on the couch and watch Netflix. Like that's the rest of our lives. Right. And people think I'm going to, I'm going to gain weight forever. I'm, I'm going to be 500 pounds because that's like this image that that's what we're told. We're told if we don't control ourselves, we're just going to balloon to be this big. That's what we're told. That's not true. It's just not true. Not when you're doing this consciously, not when you're doing it consciously. So that rubber band had to land. Okay. Which means I had to not run over and try to catch it midair and bring it back, which Mm. is what we do. So that's what people do. They start to let go. They start to gain weight. They start to eat these foods and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. And they like run and grab the band and come back. If you let the band fall, meaning all of the energy dissipates from it, you're going to eventually get to a point where you're like, And this is what happened slowly, slowly. I just didn't want to eat maybe ice cream twice during the day. Now, all of a sudden I wanted it once during the day. All of a sudden now I was like, I'm really kind of sick of eating chips. I kind of feel like I want a salad. So I would start to notice that that craving or that, that energy of just wanting to eat all these things that I denied myself for so long started to dissipate. Okay. And I came to a a point now where if if we also use it like a pendulum swing, eventually it just falls into a middle. And now I was left with, okay, I realize I can eat anything I want now. There are no rules. There's no good or bad foods. Like this was what what I'd had to learn. There are no good or bad foods or kind of come back to. Everything is on the table. What is it now that actually feels good to me to eat? And I would start, it was shifting from taking all of my cues externally, like how to follow, what to eat, what not to eat, to checking in with myself and saying, what feels good? Because in the end, why did I even care to go on this whole process? Because following the dieting and needing to be thin wasn't feeling good anymore. Like the pain started to outweigh the benefits, but I still wanted to feel good. Like that's the end game. That's all like, that's why we do anything is because we want to feel good. Well, I still want to feel good. I just didn't want to diet anymore. I just didn't want to worry about my weight anymore. I didn't want to live my life feeling insecure because I gained 10 pounds. I didn't want my sense of okayness and confidence to be based on whether or not I had a stomach roll or not. I didn't want to live that way anymore. So I had to turn inwards. And I realized that I really care about how I feel. My whole background too is based on health and wellness. 
So I actually really like, that's my, my, one of my priority values is feeling good. And so that also means what I, so couple that with the eating, I was also exercising all the time, like hard doing these hard programs and I was exhausting myself. So I stopped all of that too. So again, like you're the letting go, depending on how much you have been restricting, how hard you've been going with exercise is going to look like a big, holy crap, things are out of control until that dissipates. That is the part that is the hardest part to get through because there's a huge emotional upheaval. And there can also be um, a real, like there's an identity loss there. So at one point, the, the real turning point for me was I remember one day like hating going through this because it wasn't fun. I'm not going to lie. Like this was intense, but I lied on the couch and I remember just sobbing so upset that I was gaining weight. So upset that like everything that I had worked for, because, because again, my sense of worth and like okayness and value was hinged on looking good and being beautiful. And when I lost that, like I cried as if somebody died. Like, like I, I remember thinking, I wonder if this is the grief I'm the level of grief I might feel if I lost a parent. And I know to some people that might sound a bit like over dramatic, but when your sense of security and safety is really hinged on this, it, it can feel that scary, right? Yeah, I can totally understand that. Yeah. So that was a turning point where that kind of identity died. It was like, I knew now I couldn't get my sense of self from how I was before. So it was an emotional process. It was a physical process. So it was a combination then of realizing the letting go was, was needing to let go of false identities. It was needing to let go of all of the grasping that I was doing in order to feel okay to realize actually my value and my worth doesn't at all come from what I look like. I've just been conditioned into believing that, that my sense of worthiness and okayness is, is actually here right now. It's inherent to who I am. And it took a long time for me to like tap into that, but that is what I, what I learned and realized more realized. It wasn't really a learning, but a realizing to be true. And when I would let go then of what to eat, how to move and all that kind of stuff, I was able to just then check in with myself and say, well, what feels good to me? Because guess what? I feel good when I move my body. I I do some form of movement every day. Like it's now, it looks very different. I do a bit of yoga in the morning or I do some Qigong. Those are my current movement practices, but I do it. Per, and I also walk a bit because I like pick my daughter up and stuff outside where the city so we can walk, but I need to move. I don't feel good if I'm sitting on the couch all day. So it's not all or nothing. It's not like I'm only exercising and washing my weight and following diets or I'm doing nothing. That's what, but that's what we live in because we haven't allowed ourselves to go through this process to start to question and like get into the, the emotional nitty gritty and come back to, God, this is my life. Who am I living it for? Like, my goal in my life is to live a life that feels good to me, yeah. not to meet somebody else's opinion or idea. And so that means though, I need to check in and listen to what feels good. So that means eating ice cream every day is my primary food source doesn't feel good. I feel kind of gross if that's all I did, but it's, a, but now I don't, there's no should and shoulds. I don't have to tell myself to stop eating something. I just notice. I just check in and say, oh, you know what? I'm done with that now. Or I don't want to eat that now. It just comes so naturally because my baseline now is I feel good. And so every day, moment to moment, it's what feels good to me. 
And there's nothing in my head about you should be eating this or you should. That's not entirely true. Thoughts sometimes still pop up like that because that's like what's been dumped in my head growing up. But it's, it's like, I can let that go and be like, no, check in with what feels good. And so in this process, people might then end up gaining more weight than like they've ever, like, like I became probably the heaviest I'd ever been in my life. Right. I I can't, I I haven't weighed myself since I stopped this. So it's been like five years. So I literally have no idea how much I weigh, but, and I've been, and here's the thing I've stabilized for years. Like there's not been any fluctuations or up and down. I've just stabilized. And I think I probably lost a little bit of weight after that, but it wasn't huge, but it was a bit because once I, once I got back into that natural balance state, then my body could regulate. And mm-hmm. I wasn't like, yeah, you might gain weight if all you're eating is pizza and ice cream and chips all day and doing nothing. It just it probably is going to happen. But once you come back into that balance place, your body will probably adjust too. But the difference is, is that you're not focused on thinking that the weight needs to change in order for you to feel good in your body. It's checking. Like I always ask people like, so, so to come back to the very beginning, when you said, I'm, I notice I'm more winded. Like, I'm not like, I would ask you, like my curiosity would be what changed? Like you said, you'd been stress eating. So I'd be like, what changed in your life? Like, what have you, what's, what have you been doing differently? What, what's been going on? What have you, what did you used to do? What are you not doing now? Like, because is it really the weight or have you not been moving as frequently as you used to, you know, have you like, like I would ask and kind of get into these questions because here's something that's important to know. I guarantee you've had a moment when you, I'm I'm assuming you were probably thinner at some point in your life that you ever felt fat, but you were thin, like, or you were smaller all the time. Like we know this, right? When you look back at photos and stuff. Oh yeah. Totally. And yet you've been bigger and you've had days where you felt good, where you felt light or you felt thinner. And, and so yet it's like, how can, is it really the body size then? Because how can you feel fat when by all accounts, you are actually lighter than you were before? And how can you feel lighter if your body hasn't changed? So our internal experience of feeling good really doesn't have to do that much with our body size. And it's why we don't need to focus on our body size in order to feel good because it's an internal experience. So it's, it's getting away from the all or nothing. And it's a lot of like questioning into beliefs. There's a lot of unlearning that needs to be done because let's face it in our culture, we are just inundated with certain ideas of like, we just think this is the truth about weight and health and and feeling good in body size. And, um, but it's just not like, it's so much more nuanced to that. So that was a super long answer to your question. <laughs> I hope it also answered other questions too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was, um, you know, a couple of things that kept on popping up in my head as you were speaking. And one of them was, you know, I think women get a lot more hate for being overweight. Like there's much more of an expectation that women are beautiful and fit the mold and da, 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 da. And, you know, when you were talking about, you know, all the. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I just want to say, but like, how crazy is that? Because women's bodies are also naturally supposed to have more fat than men. So just let's throw that out there. Yeah, totally. Um, And I just, you know, Somewhere deep inside of me, there's a conspiracy theorist, um, like dying to get out. (laughs) And I think there really is something about if you have scores of women, like focused on their bodies and are they fitting the mold and are they, you know, all the, the mental energy that goes into regulating the food and, you know, tracking the diet and am I eating too many carbs? Um, should I be low fat? Should I be no carb? Should I be high protein? Like all of this stuff, like all of the diets that you say, when you put so much mental energy on that, it, it's, 
it's taking away, I don't know, I almost feel like it's taking away from sisterhood and supporting each other and allowing us to be empowered in other ways when we're constantly shitting on ourselves for eating in a certain way or not exercising that I think it just holds you all women back across the board in a lot of really significant and important ways. Like, how can I be the best parent when I'm, you know, putting all this mentor, mental energy into portioning out. And I've, I've, I've done all the things like I was, uh, I did some hard weight training back in about 2016, which I actually, again, that whole body, what your body loves and feels good. Like I actually really like working out. Like I do like weight training, but I was like tracking all of my macros And for a while, like it was great to see the changes and the gains in my strength, but I got to a point similar. I was like, I can't, this is insane. Like this is insane. I had a spreadsheet. I was like, it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, I have a full-time job. I have hobbies. I have things I want to do. And, you know, coming, going into like my work a little bit that we talked about last time going into the body, I've sort of had a similar shift recently in that there's a lot more check-in and more like I almost have conversations with my body but it's like what what do I really want and what actually feels good and I realized that I've dabbled in fasting and my body because I love as we mentioned I think off camera um, I'm quite vain And I love, um, I love some of the physical processes that happen with fasting and that like you can go into, like, there's some really compelling evidence that suggests fasting can help, um, prevent dementia and Alzheimer's. So I doubt I dabbled a little bit and it's like, you know what, if I, every, you know, once or twice a month, a week, whatever, if I skip a couple meals, my body loves it. Like that feels really good. And it almost in some ways when I do that, it gives me more energy to do other things, which seems counterintuitive, but it's like, oh, my body really loves that. And last night I went out, had a couple of too many glasses of wine, come home and I went to bed and my body's like, that's not the way. Like, so checking in, I think kind of what you're saying, like, you know, when you let the elastic band go, like wherever that lands is where it lands. And yeah, the, the wisdom piece I I'm finding, like, I don't know that I fully let the elastic band go, but there is some wisdom body wisdom that is becoming more and more online for me to like really check in and make the decisions. And along with my wine last night, I had a country fried chicken and my body loved that. Like there was no regrets about that piece. So it's like, okay, that was totally fine. Like I don't need to feel guilty mm-hmm. about, you know, that I went out and had this like decadent dinner last night. Yeah. You said a lot of there. Um, and the first, the first thing that stood out to me was when you were talking at firstly, you talked about like the sisterhood, how it can kind of take us away from that. And, and what's interesting is because, uh, and, and it happens particularly with women. I mean, I think guys are getting more into the the stuff around body size and fat too in their own, like they st- struggle in their own way. But it's been such a long history with women because women have been primarily valued for their appearance, like first and foremost, mm-hmm. over and above almost anything else, a woman will get noticed and in, in, in comments on their appearance before anything else. So that's really deeply ingrained with that in us. Um, and so because of that, when all of your girlfriends are also dieting and talking about their weight, there is sort of this weird, um, connection that can happen over dieting and commenting on your weight and criticizing yourself. Like it's, it's not helpful, but when you're also really craving that connection and you're feeling so desperate inside yourself. And I think, I think a lot of women don't even realize how desperate they're feeling. Like they don't, they're not even really attuned to how, um, how stressful and how uh, unhappy this is actually making them because it's so normal. It's like um, you don't hear a refrigerator humming in the background until it turns off. 
it's kind of the same thing. If you've just, if this is always the way that your thoughts are being, if you're constantly focused on this, if you're just used to it, that's like your baseline normal. Um, but it's, it's not really a happy normal. Like it's not, it's not uplifting you, you know, it's dragging us down, but, but that's part of the problem too, is like, we can create these communities around dieting. And that's actually, so that's actually one of the things that can come up for people um, when, you know, deciding to quote unquote, let go or to, you know, stop, step away from this is, I mean, like, let's look at Weight Watchers, for example, or some of these dieting groups, there is actual real, or like my fitness pal or whatever, there's real community and friendships and connection that people build through the process of trying to keep their body size small. And there can be a real fear of losing that, uh, losing those friendships because it is sometimes a real social shift. Right. So th that was the first thing I wanted to mention, um, is I don't think it's, th there is a real element of wanting to be connected with people. Um, but it's through this process that ultimately in the end is not really serving us. So, oh. The second piece I wanted to mention now, you made you made a comment about intermittent fasting and the compelling research. I, I mean, I heard that too. And I've also heard the other side of it as well. Like, so one of the things that has been uh, really interesting for me through this whole process was understanding more about looking into research. So there's um, <laughs> there's a lot of bad research out there, especially the ones that get headlines. But one thing that I learned was really true is that it's very, it's actually very difficult to do research around food and how it impacts us because you can't isolate for all of the other different factors that influence somebody's health. So if you're going to be doing it like a control group, say, for example, on intermittent fasting, like, I don't know, we don't know, like, what is the lifestyle of this person or like, what are all, there's so many factors that influence our health, but we're just told it's diet and exercise. Um, and then when you really get into the granular aspect of the research, you can find flaws in it. And I don't that, like, that's not my expertise, but I follow people who's that's their expertise. And so I learned, I was like, oh, I just always thought like this was legit. And this is what I was told. Um, so I've come to be skeptical of it, but I look at it and say, I'm not, it doesn't really matter. Like, and I get when we think, okay, sure. Like, I don't want dementia or Alzheimer's when I get older. And if I can do something now that might prevent it, why not? It's not proven yet, right? Like there's just some, like some yeah. early evidence. And so we don't know that for sure. They're just speculating based on like early stuff. And again, people could argue it, but I look at it and say, we're living our life right now. And you don't know if you're going to get hit by a bus tomorrow. <laughs> I've also known people who've done everything right. They were the picture of health and got cancer and died. You know, I've also known people who've like been eating country fried chicken and doing shots of whiskey every day in their life and living until 99, like sharp as a whistle. So we don't know. There's no magic cure pill. What we are doing is we're living now. So if you notice, like, for example, I've noticed I don't like to eat first thing in the morning. Like I need a couple of hours before I actually eat. You don't need to follow intermittent fasting to just check in with yourself and notice like maybe you're kind of intermittent fasting and you don't realize it. Like you were calling it that, but you can use your own body as a guide. So if you notice you feel good when you take a break sometimes from eating food, that's all you need to know. You yeah. don't, it's like, yeah. you don't need some research telling you that it's like, check in with yourself. And that's the whole point. Use you as your guide. And that is the wisdom. So we have wisdom within us all the time, but it gets clouded over by our thinking, by all of the shoulds and shouldn'ts and fear thoughts and this, and, and what, and this is good. And this is bad. Like if you had a clear mind, you actually don't need thought in order to have an insight or to know what to do. You don't need it. You just know, call it instinct, call it intuition, call it what you want. 
there is a deeper source of intelligence that we have within us, body wisdom that guides us. So that, like, I mean, that is ultimately when I work with my clients, what I get, I focus on getting them to is let your wisdom guide you. Your wisdom cares about you. Your wisdom is not telling you to eat a whole cheesy pizza every night. It's not, that's not your wisdom. That's a reaction of something. Your wisdom will guide you. And I'm here to be like, I'm going to help you look at what is getting in the way of you listening to your wisdom, all of your fears, all of your beliefs, all of the emotions that are coming up to, to see what's happening, to understand how to deal with that when that happens. So you can come back to listening to your wisdom because your wisdom will guide you in the right direction. And you don't need input from anybody else to notice that. And it's not to say wisdom won't guide you to like try a workout plan at some point if you're interested in it, but it's coming from a good feeling place, not from like, oh no, I have to do this or else. Yeah. And it's so funny, like, you know, we touched on this before when we uh, last spoke, but that body wisdom is a key in what I do as well. And I think it's, I think it's something that as a culture we have lost and it impacts, you know, how we eat, how we move our body it impacts, how we engage with our pleasure. And I think no matter what your goals are in your life, if you can learn how to tune into that wisdom, I think that's like the first step to moving into this life where you are just living for yourself and being happy and realizing that it's your life and letting go of that conditioning. Like, I think that body wisdom piece is the absolute stepping stone, the baseline, the foundation of so many things in our life. Like, well, like broadly wellness, broadly fitness, broadly happiness. We are born with it though. That's the thing. That's actually what we listen to before we are conditioned out of it. Because when we are little and we are young, we don't know anything, right? Like we, our mind hasn't been inputted with all of these ideas yet of how you're supposed to eat, how you're supposed to move, what you're supposed to do. No, we listen to our wisdom. We listen to, I feel this excites me. I'm interested in this. I don't want to eat this, but I'll eat that. And Oh, that can be a whole other tangent about kids and eating, but we'll leave that for another time. It's, (laughs) it's, um, we are guided by that. And then stuff happens to us and we learn these things from people. We learn these things from authority figures, right? From people who know better than us. We are taught to ignore listening to our wisdom because we are either told that what our wisdom is telling us is wrong. Like we're told that by somebody else. It doesn't um, align with maybe what our parents or other people in our, our culture want for us. So we, we ignore it. And we end up following, yes, I will do what you want because I want you to love me. And I'm afraid if I don't do this, you're not going to love me. And when, when, by the way, we're a little tiny child, that's very real. We need that for survival. So we end up like, end up following other people and not listening to ourselves, like pretty innocently. I'm not saying everybody does this, but most of us have. And definitely, definitely clients who come to me who have got to a point where they have spent almost their whole life dieting have stopped listening to their inner wisdom. They are listening to other people. So this is a reclamation of it. Like it's here now. You can tap into it in this moment. You never lost it. You you're attuned to it. It's just, we, we forgot like all of this stuff got in the way. All of these beliefs are just, they're loud and they're telling us, no, you can't listen to your wisdom. So it just blocks over our, our doing it. So it's a reconnecting to and retrusting that we can listen to it. That's yes. the process. And that goes for food and everything. And then we just look at what is it that is getting in the way of you following that? And all that will happen is we'll pop up these beliefs these limiting beliefs and these ideas that we were told are true, that we believed in, but they're not really real. They're just, you. Are, if the only way it gives them power is if you believe them. You don't have to. And so we start to knock those down and just be like, come back here, come back here, come back here. 
And that's the process. And then guess what? Guess what the result of that is? Being happy. <laughs> Which is what we were hoping want, and, yeah. and looking beautiful and, and being yeah. successful and in, in, in doing all these things were going to get us. That's what we were hoping it was going to get us. But we realized actually we have it here right now. Well, and I think having that happiness and like really living from a joyous place, like that attracts the things that we wanted in the first place. Totally. Like, like we come at it from the wrong end. Yep. It's backwards. We're taught it backwards. We're taught to like look outside of ourselves for the answers. It's reverse. We have to reverse that around and be like, actually, we need to look inward for the answers. We are designed to be, we we come as a fully like sustainable guidance. We have a guidance system within us. We don't need, it's, we don't lack anything. We don't lack anything. Everything else was a distraction, making us think we lack something. We don't. We come fully equipped to move through this life in a way that feels good to us, that brings us joy, that brings us pleasure. All of that is already innately designed within us. Like we're this perfect little tool to do that. And so now it's just relearning how to to, to access that and follow that. And then yeah. that's it. Then we get to like just be happy and live our lives. <laughs> you solved everything, Christina. <laughs> um yeah I wanted to um just one last point on my little notes um this and I think a lot of people have this idea that being overweight is absolutely you talk about correlation and causation is absolutely correlated to poor health I wanted mm-hmm. you to speak on that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's important one, because that is actually a huge barrier to anybody feeling like they can let go or to not diet anymore. Um, so I will say this, there is a book that I came across when I first started in my journey and I still recommend it to people and it's called health at every size by Linda Bacon. And what she does is she really dives in. She actually, like, she's a, she was a PhD researcher. She was just interested in for herself, like learning more about the weight health correlation. And what she ended up discovering through her research was that all that the right now it's, it seems like it's a fact that if you are a higher weight, it's going to cause you to have poor health conditions. What she found out is that there isn't actually any research that can prove causation. That it says that the higher body weight itself is the cause of these poor health conditions. It shows a correlation. So so correlation just means like one thing is happening in the presence of another, right? Um, The, I think an example she uses in the book is if somebody, um, let's say smoking and lung cancer, there is a correlation between people who have lung cancer and they have yellow teeth, right? So if we looked at that, if you you could look at that and say, uh-oh, like we better whiten those teeth up so that you don't get lung cancer. Well, we know that that's ridiculous. Like that's not going to do anything. But so so what is it? Well, we know that people who smoke tend to have yellow teeth from the smoking, but it's the smoking that's actually causing the lung cancer, not the yellow teeth. So it's actually the same with a higher body weight and these conditions. So as I was mentioning before, there are so many different factors that influence our health, right? Another thing to note is that there's not a single health condition that that you can find in somebody in a higher body size that somebody in a smaller body size also can't have. So it's not like just people in higher body weights are getting these conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes are like the big ones, right? I have a friend who is like a twig and she has struggled with high blood pressure. I have another friend who is a guy who like, it's like ripped and like, you know, all intents and purposes is healthy and he struggles with high cholesterol. So we tend to like disregard those cases and say, no, that just must be some anomaly, but the people in the higher body weight, it's the higher body weight. Well, what is it that has influenced that person, those conditions? I can tell you that both of like my one friend who struggles with high cholesterol is stressed. 
out of his mind, you know? So, and he has chronic stress. The one who struggled with high blood pressure during those times of high blood pressure was under a lot of stress. So chronic stress is, we also know is associated with about 90% of these illnesses. So we might want to start looking there and then we need to look at lifestyle. So, so many other factors are influencing people's lifestyle. Now it might just happen if you're stressed all the time. Okay. Maybe why are you stressed? Like what's going on? Are you struggling in a relationship? Are you struggling to make ends meet? Like, let's look at this people who are living in poverty right now, right? Like people who are struggling to make ends meet, they're likely having to work a lot physically time in their day, right? Maybe they're working two jobs. If you're working, they're probably then living in places that, um, aren't the most optimal. So maybe they're like having to live next to a factory where they're now in, in ingesting all of these like smoke and chemicals that are coming from the factory. There's probably not a lot of like nice parks around or like safe places to walk at night if you're in a lower income area. So they might not feel safe going out for a walk at night at the end of their shift after they've been working a 12 hour shift. Do they even have the energy? We also know that there's like things like food deserts or even just the price of you also don't have the time to make fresh food, right? Like let's even just look at that. So if you're working, so like, let's start to see all of these different influences and factors now that might be leading somebody to be in a higher body size, but the body size is blamed and is said as the cause. And we're not Mm -hmm. looking at all of the different factors that might be influencing somebody's ability to be well. There are also people in higher body sizes who have no health problems. They actually are as metabolically as fit as a fiddle, but because the medical community has been so trained and conditioned that fat is the cause of health problems, they also disregard that too. So they disregard the conditions and the people who are thin. They'll actually even tell the thin people to lose weight too, because that's what they were just told. Like it's, it's crazy, but they'll also disregard it in higher body weight. Oh my God, read the book. You'll hear all of this. Another thing that was really important that I learned in this too, was there was a long-term study that was done that showed that people who are in the overweight category of the BMI actually live the longest Hmm. out of everybody in the BMI. And the people in the obese category lived just about as long. Like they might have might have been a little bit less, but it was, they actually, the worst, like there was a worse length in that and, um, poor health outcomes in the, in the normal category. And if we think about it, the other thing that we don't take into consideration is that when we restrict our food and when we go on diets, our body doesn't know that we're dieting. It's not like, oh, you're going on a diet to like lose 10 pounds for whatever. It thinks there's a famine. And the, the reality is, is I remember when my baby was born, she gained weight very rapidly. And she was a chubby little thing, like roly pole, like rolls on her arms, like rolls everywhere. Okay. So first of all, she wasn't eating Cheetos and Netflixing all day. Like she was drinking breast milk. I wasn't Cheetosing and Netflixing. So it's not like, like, this is just what happened. This is her, where her body size, the midwives couldn't have been happier because they were like, this is great. Like she has, because she needed that. Cause if she ever got sick she would lose weight rapidly and she would be in serious trouble because when people get sick, if you notice, they lose weight. Failure to thrive will often result in people. When people are dying, they lose weight. So our bodies are actually designed to have extra weight on it as like a backup, as like a safety. Because if we were to get sick or something were to happen, we have reserves now. So our body's actually happy being quote unquote overweight, according to the BMI, like for a lot of people than not. So we're actually better equipped to be overweight than we are to be underweight. So anyways, that's just like, literally I could talk another hour on this. So I will stop. As you can tell, I love talking about this. Um, But that would be the, like that book is a great starting point. There's actually three books I would recommend to people. Health at Every Size by Linda Bacon now goes by Lindo Bacon, but I think you might still be under Linda Bacon. Um, Intuitive Eating 
is another book by Elise Resch and Evelyn Triboli, who are dietitians. And then the third one is called The Secrets to Feeding a Healthy Family um, by Alan Satter. Those three are great at um, answering a lot of questions that people might have about uh, the research, the weight and the health and the food and all of that. Awesome. I'll um, link those below as well, along with you have a free guide that um, I downloaded and found very, very helpful guide to body acceptance. So that's um, also on your website. And I think those books are actually listed in that guide. They so. are. I believe they are. Yeah. 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 Um, so is there any, you know, if you had to say one thing to the people listening, um, what would it be? that everybody gets to do what they want with their body. So I'm not here to like tell people don't diet, that it's wrong if you want to lose weight. Like it does, everybody's on their own journey. There's no right or wrong here. What I want to say is, is that if you are someone who just feels like you want to feel free, you want to be happy, you want to feel secure and worthy and strong in yourself. And in any way you feel like your body size is tied into that. I just want to say like, it's, you you can feel all of that without having to be a certain size, that that's absolutely 100% possible. Um, I know because I'm living it myself and I've seen other people do it too. And that actually the focus on the body size is taking you away from knowing your true value and your worth and living a happy life now. So you don't, you can actually live a life, not even worrying about your body size ever again. It's like so wonderful. (laughs) Beautiful. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. It's always wonderful to chat with you. And um, thanks to everybody who um, joined us and watched.